The scriptural background and inspiration for the ancient Requiem Mass comes, of course, from the Apocalypse of St. John. So a couple of scripture readings from Revelation chapter 14 and 21. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Blessed are the dead who die in the Spirit, for they rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them, and they will be God's people. And God will wipe away every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be crying, nor mourning, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. And then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Thanks be to God for God's holy word. So a Requiem Mass is probably the most serious music in the Western repertoire, right? At least that's the way Mozart and Berlioz and Verdi conceived of their Requiems in the 18th and 19th centuries. Their Requiem Masses are dark, brooding, and solemn. It is grave music in both senses of the word. Serious music for the lip of the grave. But Gabriel Faure, as you've just heard, took his music in a different direction. When Mr. Faure composed his Requiem in 1888, probably to honor his recently deceased father, he traded bombast and solemnity for simplicity and lucidity. He seems to have understood that a Requiem Mass is not so much a lament for the dead as a celebration of Christ's resurrection victory, yes? So the French composer Gabriel Faure was born in 1845 and died in 1924 at the age of 79. He was a church organist for most of his musical career, the Susan Klotzbach of turn of the 20th century Paris. He was a student of Saint-Saëns, a teacher of Ravel, and played dueling pipe organs now and then in Paris with Charles Marie Vidor. And Faure's buoyant, sanguine requiem reflects the composer's own sunny disposition. Everybody loved Faure. He was lighthearted and easygoing. For a while, he attempted to function as a music critic for the Paris newspaper Le Figaro, but he found it impossible to say absolutely anything the least bit critical, which is a fatal flaw for a critic, right? I guess he figured if you can't be as mean and sardonic as Anthony Tomasini or Ben Brantley in the Times, you might as well hang it up. With his thick black hair, his trademark mustache, and his olive complexion, he was, says one of his biographers, and I quote, a magnet for the ladies. Lady magnet or no, he had turned 40 before he'd married, and so the Paris equivalent of the million-dollar matchmaker set him up with three promising young women, all from the world of art or music, and when he couldn't decide which of them to marry, he threw their names into, into a hat and drew out the name of Marie Frémier. It didn't take Monsieur Faure too long to discover that this might not be the most sensible way to choose a lifelong love. But... His unhappy marriage did not tarnish his sunny disposition. He sought solace in other quarters, if you know what I mean. As I said, Faure was a church organist for much of his career, most of it at the Madeleine Church in Paris. Very tony congregation. One of his biographers said that the Madeleine was not so much a church as a place for the rich and famous to show off. And so the greatest fashion show in Paris every week was after Mass on Sunday mornings when the ladies would exit the church for the boulevards of Paris. I am so glad we don't have churches like that in America. And so this is where Faure's Requiem got its premiere in 1888 for the funeral of a prominent architect. Faure, they say, was always fighting with the senior minister at the Madeleine. 
After the service where it was premiered, the priest approached Maestro Foré and said, what was that piece of music you played during the service? And Foré said, that is a music of my own composition. And he said, we don't need such novelties. Our repertoire is rich enough already. You see, probably the priest noticed that Foré had muted the frightening aspect of judgment so prominent in the requiems of Mozart and Berlioz and Verdi. Perhaps the senior minister didn't think the, this requiem would literally scare the hell out of people, which is what requiems are supposed to do, right? Perhaps the priest noted that Foray kept slipping in that phrase, requiem eternum, eternal rest, over, all over the place in this piece, in places where it didn't belong. And maybe the senior pastor noticed that Maestro Foray added two serene movements to his requiem that really don't belong there and didn't appear in the requiems of Mozart and Verdi and Berlioz. The serene Pia Jesu, sweet Jesus, give them rest, give them rest eternal. And then at the end, that tranquil, haunting in Paradisum, a text which was normally sung not during the requiem mass itself, but when the body was exiting the church for the cemetery. May the angels lead thee into paradise at thy coming. May the martyrs receive thee and bring thee into the holy city, Jerusalem. Perhaps Maestro Foré inherited his tranquil attitude towards death from St. John of the Apocalypse. God will wipe away every tear from their eye and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be crying, nor mourning, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Maestro Foray himself said, that's how I see death, as a joyful deliverance, an aspiration for happiness beyond the grave. I never noticed this till this week when I was thinking about the In Paradisum movement. But when Prince Hamlet dies in Shakespeare's play, it's Hamlet's friend Horatio, of course, who delivers the clipped, interrupted eulogy. Now cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Horatio is alluding to the ancient text of the Requiem Mass, the In Paradisum. May the angels lead thee to paradise. At thy coming, may the martyrs receive thee and bring thee into the holy city, Jerusalem. Our choristers are thinking of their friend and fellow chorister, Midge Sterrett, this morning when they sing those words. Good night, sweet princess, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest.